Good morning, everyone. Thank you for attending this webinar, an introduction to the UK Data Service. My name is Sammy, and I'm a member of the UK Data Service Access Team as an Data Access and Use Assistant. I am presenting today with my colleague. Hello, my name is Tracy, and I am also a member of the UK Data Service Access Team as a Data Access and Use Assistant. Today, we'll be delivering a quick introduction to the UK Data Service. We will be going over who we are, what data we hold, and what resources we have available. We will be using the interactive software Mentimeter. The following slide will provide instructions on how to access Mentimeter on another tab or on any second device. Using this tool, we're going to ask a few questions. This will help us understand your current experience with using the UK Data Service website. So to start with, what type of user are you? For example, are you a postgrad, staff at university? Maybe you work for a health service or a local council? OK, that's great. Thank you. OK, so we've got some researchers, students, someone from police. That's great. So it's a good mix. So secondly, have you tried to find and access data with the UK Data Service prior to coming to this webinar? Great. Okay, that's great. So a few of you have. So the big question, if you did if you have, did you find what you were looking for? Okay, we've got a mix there. Some of you didn't, so hopefully we can help you with that today. Maybe you could just tell us why you couldn't find what you were looking for. We're always looking for ways to improve our service. Okay, haven't used it, all right. Okay, in that case, lastly, what sort of data are you interested in? Okay. Oh, great. Okay, well, thank you for that. That's great. Thank you for letting us know. We're going to be covering some of those um, topics in the webinar, so hopefully we'll be able to help you find what you're looking for. So thanks for your answers. So we're going to get back to the webinar now. Here is an overview of the topics that we will be covering throughout the webinar. We will be explaining a bit about who we are and what we do, what secondary data is, what sort of data we hold, as well as talking you through the online resources that we have and a little bit about the guidance that we can provide you with. There will be questions, um, a time for questions at the end of the presentation. So what is the UK Data Service? We are pioneers in data curation and actively managing long-term access to high quality data. Our expertise continues to transform social science research, teaching and learning. Our data management training policies and protocols are used by national data archives, international research organizations and researchers since it was first established in its original form at the University of Essex in 1967. The UK Data Service is funded by the UK Research and Innovation 
and builds on investment from the Economic and Social Research Council to meet the data needs of researchers, students and teachers from all sectors, including academia, central and local government, charities and foundations, independent research centres, think tanks, business consultants and the commercial sector. Our well-established data skills training provided the necessary skills and knowledge to inform research for those new to data use via our comprehensive learning resources, training events, on-demand webinars and video tutorials around the key data types and themes, plus online support to get the most out of the UK data service. We are experts on safe research, working closely with HMRC Data Lab and the Office for National Statistic Statistics Secure Research Services to develop safe research protocols, including the five safes framework to enable secure research access to data while protecting confidentiality. We have decades of experience in all aspects of data curation, digital preservation, data access and user support. Our collection includes major UK government sponsored surveys, cross national surveys, longitudinal studies, UK census data, international aggregate data, business data and qualitative data. The UK Data Service Impact Team is expert at understanding and supporting the development of evidencing and promoting the impact of the use of data in the collection in research, teaching and policy making and the impact of the service as an ESRC funded data infrastructure. Our focus is on the demonstrable contribution the service and its data and resources make to the economy, society, culture, public policy and services, health, the environment and quality of life. We work with researchers with a range of experience and in different fields to showcase the impact of the data enhanced research through developing case studies. We encourage discussion and debate of concepts, challenges and issues in the realms of data impact and data policy theory through the data impact blog. Currently, we are showcasing poverty in data, housing and homelessness in data, and mental health in data. The blog is run by the UK Data Service and is a hub for researchers, students, communities, policy makers, government, and anyone interested in maximising the impact of social, population, and economic data in research and policy. We hope to encourage debate, share innovation, and best practice and keep the community up to date with news events and the latest data driven impactful research and policy making. Our homepage is designed to be easy to navigate and user friendly. There is a menu across the top of the page to navigate your way around depending on which topics you're interested in. There is a search bar to search the data catalogue you can use the study number if you know it, the data owner, for example, Understanding Society, to bring up a list of data sets, or a topic such as poverty. As you scroll down the home page, there are links to the latest highlights, upcoming training and events, our impact, the learning hub, the latest data collections, and new additions and a link to our training webinars. There is a yellow login button in the top right hand corner where you can log in and register. We will go over that later in the presentation. The help tab is also very useful. Again, we will look at this section in more detail later in the presentation. Moving forward for this, we will discuss who the UK Data Service is for, who can register and who can access our catalogue. Researchers, students and teachers from any discipline, organisation or country may, 
may register with the UK Data Service and obtain data. Some data sets have restrictions on access due to the data redistribution, redistribution license agreements with the data providers, but anyone can access our catalogue and browse our data sets. Most of our regular users are affiliated with higher education or further education institutions. Staff, researchers and students can access, but anyone and everyone can register with us. We have many users from other sectors, such as local and national government departments, charities and think tanks. You can register if you are a commercial user, but there may be some restrictions on what you can access and there may be a fee to do so with intended usage if the data is for commercial purposes. We also have the option for researchers not associated with an organisation to join us and peruse their interests. We are really keen for pe people to explore data, learn new things and improve their data skills. We will now share with you some information on secondary analysis and I will also present the different types of data we hold at the UK Data Service. We host a large collection of secondary data, which is data that has already been collected for a previous study by a different researcher. Research data can be collected across a range of social science disciplines using a variety of research methods. Social surveys and interviewing projects represent some of the most common methods, but you can also collect data through admin records business records and censuses. The reason why secondary data is so valuable to researchers is that primary collection can be time consuming or expensive and requires a certain level of expertise to be carried out properly. In contrast, secondary analysis or the reanalysis of data that has been collected previously can be used by new researchers looking to answer a new research question and is, more often than not, free and can be found and accessed through many sources. Using existing data can also enable research where the data may be difficult or impossible to collect, like in the case of global admin data, large-scale surveys or historic data. Using secondary data is also favoured by researchers as there is a wide range of topics and formats available to work with. And if it comes from a reliable source, it can be representative, robust and transparent as well. This means that all the information on how the data was collected and sampled and all other details needed to conduct research with it will also be available with the study in the documentation section of the data set. This is a role that the UK Data Service plays. We facilitate access to this secondary data and also provide advice and support through the application process for it. The data we hold comes from a wide range of sources and we are allowed to disseminate on them under license from the original data depositor. They are separated into end user license studies, special license studies and secure access data sets, each following a different procedure to apply and re uh, receive access to. We are hosting a webinar on the 12th of March called Finding and Accessing Data from the UK Data Service. We will talk more in depth about the different levels of access and the application process for each type of data. If you are interested and would like to learn more about it, check out the training and events section of our website for the details. We have also included a link to the event at the end of our presentation. Back to secondary data. It is important to stress that we are not involved in the collection process for those. They are deposited with us 
and we curate, preserve and catalogue them and make them available to researchers through the UK Data Service. Some of the most prominent sources for the data we hold are national statistic authorities, UK government departments, intergovernmental organisations, research institutes, including the Institute for Social and Economic Research, or ISA, and the Centre for Longitudinal Studies, CLS. Individual researchers may have done research for their masters, their PhD, or funded research. Researchers that are funded by the ESRC also deposit their data with us through research, ReShare, which is available online and is a repository. Data deposited in this way is also available through our data catalogue. If you are wondering how many studies we hold in our catalogue, the answer would currently be more than 9,200 data sets. The Find Data tab on the home page has a section where you can browse and access data and by clicking through, you will come to the Browse by Theme page. As you can see, we hold data on a number of topics such as ageing, COVID-19, crime, economics, environment and energy, education, ethnicity, food, health, housing, information and communication, labour, politics and poverty. You can also browse by data type, which we will cover over the next few slides. We will be guiding you through the four types of data set that you can find available through the UK Data Service. These are survey microdata, international macro data, census data, and last but not least, qualitative and mixed methods data. The survey microdata includes major UK surveys, both cross-national and longitudinal. The international macro data includes multinational data banks and survey data. The census data are derived into aggregate data for 1971 to 2011, micro data for 1991 to 2011, flow data and boundary data. And finally, the qualitative and mixed methods section will be about a range of multimedia qualitative sources and a general mix of quantitative and qualitative data. The UK Data Service holds a wide range of survey microdata. These are usually individual or household and that technically means that the data has been collected for an individual or a household that responded to the survey. An example would be a survey collecting data on age, home address, level of education, employment status and such. These variables would have to be recorded for each individual or group of individuals taking part in the survey. For this reason, the data has to be anonymized to prevent disclosure or make it not possible to identify the individuals that took part in the survey from their responses. Survey microdata usually contains large samples and are nationally representative. This type of data is usually analyzed using a statistics package like SPSS, STATA or R. Survey microdata can be really flexible as they allow you to produce your own tables and to look at the relationships between multiple attributes. For example, how someone's education status affects their income. Some of the most commonly used microdata are UK surveys. The surveys are produced by experienced research organisations such as the ONS and the National Centre for Social Research, who have had many years of experience in sampling, data collection and analyses. 
They have their own methodologists, researchers and teams of interviewers, so they are very high quality data. These surveys are mostly nationally representative at the UK level or the countries within the UK, depending on the particular survey. They also tend to have a large sample sizes. For example, the Labour Force survey interviews 60,000 people every quarter. There are two main types of surveys that we are, will be looking at today. These are cross-sectional and longitudinal. Longitudinal surveys can be broken down into cohort and panel studies as well, which we will look at later on. Looking first at cross-sectional surveys, these collect data for a single point in time. A lot of the studies found in the UK Data Service catalogue are repeated cross-sectional surveys. Many of them are repeated annually or most years, but each time they are run, they use a new sample of people. They often do use the same questions each time they run the surveys, so they can be used to track trends in the population over time. Here are some examples of the widely used surveys. The Crime Survey for England and Wales, formerly known as the British Crime Survey, provides an important source of information about levels of crime, public attitudes to crime and other related issues. These results play an important role in informing government policy. The survey measures the amount of crime in England and Wales by asking people about crimes they have experienced in the last year. This includes crimes not reported to the police, so it is an important alternative to the police records. A second example is the British Attitude, Social Attitude Survey. Since 1983, the British Social Attitude Survey has been tracking the views and opinions of the public on big issues facing the nation. For every, every year, the National Centre for Social Research, or NATSEN, invites the British public to share their views on a range of topics such as work, equalities, welfare, health, and even how the country is run. Households for this survey are randomly selected from across England, Scotland and Wales to take part in the study. This is a, this way we are able to get truly unbiased picture of the attitudes in Britain. We will have a look at the crime survey for England and Wales in a bit more detail to give you all a better overview of a particular data set. The Crime Survey for England and Wales is an example of a repeated cross-sectional survey and it is used to look at aggregate population changes over time. It samples those aged 16 and above, but since 20, 2009 a smaller sample for those aged between 10 and 15 years of age was added. The survey collects information on whether the participants have been victims of crime or antisocial behaviour in the last 12 months. And interestingly, the question also covers topics such as demographics and other information such as participants' attitudes towards the police or the criminal justice system as a whole. We have covered cross-sectional surveys and now we are moving on to longitudinal data. These studies collect data through longitudinal surveys. Similar to cross-sectional surveys, longitudinal data have, a large, have also large samples and are nationally representative. The one key difference between the two types of surveys, however, is that while cross-sectional surveys interview different individuals each year, Longitudinal surveys follow the same individuals or households over time and they ask the same questions. So data is collected on the same variables for the same individuals over an extended period of time. It makes it possible for researchers to observe change 
at the individual level over an observed period. For example, these data could help address questions like what factors in earlier life can predict having poor health when you are middle aged? Like I mentioned before, there are two main types of longitudinal studies, panel studies and cohort studies. We are going to look at the difference between them in the following slides. Panel studies, to start with, collect different data at different waves, which are different measurement points. The panel members interviewed are people sampled across the whole population to include respondents of all ages. The frequency of the waves depends on the type and design of the study. For example, if you are dealing with an election study, you might want to ask the participants these questions several times throughout the election year to monitor if and how their views have changed. For that reason, the core content of the questions in a panel survey remains unchanged so that you can observe the changes in key measurements over time, but it is not uncommon for additional questions on different topics to be included in the survey. An example of that is if a researcher wants to investigate a particular issue, then they can add new questions to a specific wave of the study. An example of a panel study is Understanding Society. This is a very popular data collection held by the UK Data Service and it is known as Understanding Society, the UK Household Longitudinal Study. It is the largest longitudinal household panel survey and provides vital evidence on life changes and stability. The Understanding Society study is based at the Institute for Social and Economic Research, or ISA, at the University of Essex. It follows participants over a long period of time, giving us a long-term perspective on people's lives. It helps explore how life in the UK is changing and what stays the same over many years. Interviewing everyone in the household to see how different generations experience life in the UK. The study helps find out about parents and children, siblings, new family formation and a, the wider family and community links. The sample size for the study is large, 40,000 households, which is around 100,000 individual interviews. This allows for researchers to investigate the experiences of different subgroups and ethnic minorities over time. The study also includes an ethnic minority boost sample and a number of biomarkers. Biomarkers represent biological indicators of health risks that are known to be associated with a current future disease. It is it also consents to be linked to administrative data such as health and education data. The topics covered by the study incl include the participants' current employment and earnings, benefit payments, political party identification, household finances, environmental behaviours, parenting and childcare arrangements, family networks, religion, ethnicity and health. Another kind of a longitudinal study is the cohort study. Rather than waves, the measurement points for cohort studies are generally called sweeps. These type of studies follow individuals who have a particular event in common. Because they are interviewed at a key point in time, they are interviewed less frequently than panel studies. The most common event that these follow are people born in one week in a particular year and tracks them over time. Some will follow the cohort over their entire lifetime. These are called birth cohort studies. Cohort studies tend to focus on topics regarding health and social 
and economic circumstances. Now we are going to cover the three most popular cohort studies held by the UK Data Service. The first example is the 1958 National Child Development Study. This is following the lives of an initial 17,000 people born in England, Scotland and Wales in a single week of 1958. It has collected information on their physical and educational development, economic circumstances, employment, family life, health behaviour, well-being, social participation and attitudes. The study has become an invaluable data source on such topics as the effects of socio-economic circumstances and child adversities on health and social mobility. It has also become an important resource for the study of genetics. The 1970 British Cohort Study, or BCS70, began in 1970 when data were collected about the births and families of babies born in England, Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland in one particular week in 1970. The first survey called the British Birth Survey was carried out by the National Birthday Trust Fund in association with the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists. It, its aims were to look at the social and biological characteristics of the mother in relation to neonatal morbidity and to compare the results with those of the 1958 National Child Development Study. The Millennium Cohort Study is the UK's newest longitudinal birth cohort study and follows the lives of a sample of babies born between the 1st of September 2000 and the 31st of August 2001 in England and Wales and between the 22nd of November 2000 and the 11th of January 2002 in Scotland and Northern Ireland. When the cohort members were young, they were interviewed roughly every two years. At present, interviews take place roughly every three years. It aims to chart the conditions of socio, social, economic and health advantages and disadvantages facing children born at the start of the 21st century. The study has been tracking the millennium children through their early childhood years and plans to follow them into adulthood. It also provides the basis for comparing patterns of development with the preceding cohort studies, the National Child Development Study and the 1970 British Cohort Study. There is another type of microdata that I want to mention briefly, cross-national surveys. Cross-national surveys use the same survey instrument and where possible, the same methodology and fieldwork protocols. They allow for often comparisons to be made across many countries and nations. Common to topics covered include education, income, working conditions and poverty. Examples in our catalogue include the European Working Conditions Survey, European Quality of Life Survey, Young Lives, an international study of childhood poverty, Young Lives School Survey, European Values Study, and the National Youth Social Action Survey. The next type of data we are looking at is the international macro data. Aggregate or macro data are data that has been aggravated to a country or regional level. Unlike microdata, which looks at the individual or household level, macrodata are time series data, and depending on the database, they are available annually, quarterly, or monthly. We update these data regularly, with some databases being updated as frequently as every month. 
Our international macro data also contains socio-economic time series data aggregated to a country or regional level for a range of countries over a substantial period of time. Many of the data banks that are current that the current releases of the major statistical publications produced by intergovernmental organisations. Much of this data is only available through the UK Data Service to staff and students from UK higher or for further education institutions. This is due to the access conditions that were agreed with the data owners. However, Data sources such as the World Bank databases are now open access. All the aggregate data, ba data banks contain time series data collectively charting over 50 years of global social and economic change. The topics covered by them include national accounts, industrial production, employment, trade, demography, human development, and other indicators of national performance and development. So how can you access this data? You can download the data you require from visiting the International Aggregate Data Bank on the UKDS webpage. It hosts hundreds of economic and social data sets provided by the World Bank, OECD, International Monetary Fund, United Nations and the International Energy Agency. You can view the data by provider and it enables you to extract the information you require from a large socio-economic international data sets available through the UK Data Service. There is a number of user guides and video tutorials to help you use it. There is also a video that can be found on the UK Data Service YouTube channel called Accessing, Exploring and Visualising International Data. We're now going to move to our third data type, which is census data. The census has a long history going back to 1801 and it takes place every 10 years. The census data for 2021 was released in, Ju in July 2022. The UK Data Service has made the data tables and accompanying metadata available for download via the UK Data Service census site. This first release of data contains estimates of population by age and sex for both region regional and local authorities in England and Wales. Forthcoming releases from the ONS are expected to cover topics such as UK armed forces veterans, housing, health and unpaid care. The most novel feature of the 2021 census operations is that they have been designed from the outset to be digital first, with around 75% of the population expected to complete this questionnaire online. Additionally, the 2021 census is the first to include questions on sexual orientation and gender identity, and respond, re respondents answered on an entirely voluntary basis. Census data aims to cover 100% of the population and is used as a baseline for other statistics. It contains detailed combinations of characteristics in a range of topics. The data is available in many geographies and this makes it possible to reliably compare different areas which makes it so unique. Through the UK Data Service you can get access to four kinds of census data which are aggregate data, boundary data, flow data and census microdata. Most of the data are now open access, although there may be some restrictions on some elements of the census data that we have. Census aggregate data and census flow data are available to anyone under the open government license. Only registered users 
are able to access some of the data, such as boundary data. Census microdata have different access conditions depending on the data set of interest. Aggregate data provides counts of usually individuals or households with particular characteristics for an area. These areas may be large or small. The benefit of having census data is that it allows you to be very flexible. So you, you may want to produce tables and graphs based on a very small population. For example, the number of people who are aged over 50 and unemployed within each of the wards of the District of Greater Manchester. In this example, the 50 unemployed are a combination of characteristics and our geographical zone is the District of Greater Manchester. If you are interested in using aggregate census data, then you can use Infuse for the 2001 and 2011 census. There is no update currently for 2021. You can see on the interface on the slide here, and it's all done within your web browser via the UK Data Service website. Infuse is designed to guide users in selecting census aggregate data relating to combinations of characteristics and areas of interest to them. You can pick your topics from the option shown on the screen and you can specify your parameters to produce outputs. We also provide access to various boundary data from 1981 to 2011 for a range of geographies. The boundaries are available in a range of geographic information system or GIS formats and can be explored through the boundary data selector on our website. This is currently available for 1981, 1991, 2001 and 2011 census data as well as other boundaries. You can start by selecting the country you are researching and then the geography and the dates you are interested in. We have another video on the UK Data Service YouTube channel on how to download boundary data. If you are interested in boundary data, please do have a look at this as it can be a very helpful research for using this tool. Now, we are moving on to the next type of census data, which is what we call census flow data also known as interaction data. These are data that relate to flows of people between places. Whereas most census data relate to counts of people at single locations, flow data describe interactions between two locations, origin and destination. The most common flow data relate to migration derived from place of residence on the census day compared with the usual residence in the previous year, and commuting flows, the difference between place of residence and place of work. Although data from the 2011 census also include information of movements between main and second addresses. Currently, migration and commuting data from the 1981, 1991, 2001 and 2011 censuses are available through our web-based interface to create interaction data, which is called WICKED. In another flexible interface providing access to flow data. There are also some annual migration data derived from NHS patient registers that are available there too. The final type of census data we are looking at is census microdata. We provide access to cross-sectional census microdata. These are anonymized individual level records sampled from a single census. 
They are large individual level files which resemble the sort of data that might be collected directly from a questionnaire. Because individual records contain a wide range of individual and household characteristics, the data enable multivariate analysis for a whole range of purposes. Census microdata tends to be more flexible as you can produce your own tables, populations and attributes. The UK Data Service holds contemporary data from the 1981 to 2011 censuses and the microdata samples from 1961 onwards. These, are, these used to be called SARS, which is samples of anonymised records. These samples are 1 to 5% depending on the data set produced by the census. Updates are still ongoing for the 2021 census. Here are some topics that census microdata cover. These range from migration, education and employment to social class and income, language and geographic information. The last type of data to be covered today, and that is qualitative and mixed methods data. Qualitative data are non-numeric information. They can be interview transcripts, diaries, anthropological field notes, answers to open-ended questions, audio or visual recordings and images. If you are looking for this type of data in our catalogue, you can filter your search by selecting qualitative or mixed methods as a type of data, or you can access them through Qualibank. The Qualibank is a great tool that allows you to search for qualitative data, but also within qualitative data for keywords and terms. In the example we can see on the slide, we have searched for the term ill health and got this essay as a result from the School Leavers Survey of 1978. So you can use this as a way to narrow down your search and see if specific terms are mentioned within the resources. So now we're going to talk about how to register. As mentioned earlier, you will need to register to access some data sets with the UK Data Service. So for those of you not registered with us, this is how you can do so. Find and click on the yellow button as shown here. If you are a student or member of a UK or staff at a UK institution of higher education or further education, your institution is most likely a member of the UK Access Management Federation, which means you can register using the username and password issued by your institution. Just begin by typing your organisation in the box as shown here. It should be automatically generated. Click continue and your own organisational login page will be displayed. You'll be able to log in with your usual username and password. All you need to do then is complete the registration form and agree to the end user licence agreement. If you are not a UK academic user or your organisation does not appear on the list, then check the box at the bottom left hand corner that says my organisation is not listed. You can then follow the link to request a username. Enter your email address and we will send you a one time code. Enter the code into the box at the bottom of the page and we will contact you with a username and details of how to complete your registration. We aim to get back to you within five working days. Once you have registered with us, you are free to download and access the data which we have spoken about today, as well as many others through the use of our catalogue and other search tools. If you wish to find out more about how to search our catalogue, please sign up for the webinar on the 12th of March from 11am to 12.30pm. You can sign up for this event via our webpage. This webinar will go through in more detail about the process of finding and accessing data, different access requirements and what you need to know to search and find the data. 
We also have resources to help you figure out how to use the data that we provide. There is a section of the website dedicated to this. We want to see data used to its maximum potential. So to help with that, we offer these resources. The Learning Hub section of the website contains information, advice, and support to enhance your data skills, including teaching with data. The New to Using Data section may be useful to those who are using data for the first time. It includes best practice and training for researchers who are new to accessing the data in our collection. It also includes advice and tools to correctly cite data. If you're going to be using quantitative or secondary data from us, do have a look into that. In the middle section on this slide, you can see we also have data skills modules available. These introductory level interactive models modules are designed for users who want to get to grips with key aspects of survey, longitudinal and aggregate data. Modules can be completed in your own time and you are able to dip in and out when needed. They give an introduction to key aspects of the data using short instructional videos interactive quizzes and activities using open ac access software where possible. Each module stands alone, but those with little experience of surveys might find, might find it useful to start with the survey data module before moving on to the longitudinal data module. We also offer guidance for using real research data to bring teaching and learning to life. You can use our extensive teaching data, data collections and resources to support your teaching and learning. They have been designed to allow students to analyze the data from our collections containing key variables and topics of interest. We have worksheets and specific guidance for those teaching data. When you're ready to explore our help pages, click on help on the right hand side, just under the login button. This is designed for both new and existing users. You will see on the screen that is in categorized under different sections. You can see that there is a section dedicated to registration and login, frequently asked questions and how to register. There is another section entitled advice for new users. Here you will find information about citing data, tips on how to search the catalogue and the importance of the data documentation and frequently asked questions. The how to get data and access information section covers questions you may have about data for your project, how to download the data and questions about variables. The Secure Lab section is a guide to all things involved with downloading and accessing controlled data via our Secure Lab platform. The Different Data Types section covers much of the same material that we have discussed today in the webinar. The Exploring Data Online section covers tools that can be used to explore data, including Nestar, Dotstat, the Integrated Census Microdata, or ISEM tool, Historical Population Reports, or HISPOP, links to the National Archives, and links to other tools discussed in the webinar, such as Wicked, Infuse, and others. How to Deposit Data has links about how you can deposit data or share syntax with us via our reshare, and how to prepare data for this process. Searching for data discusses tools that we have available for searching for data, such as Qualibank, Hasset, and the Variable and Question Bank. Other data providers is a series of links to other secure research facilities, ready-made statistics, question banks, qualitative data providers, other open data resources from around the world, international data providers, 
International Data Archives and a link to SESTA catalogue. Finally, I'd like to draw attention to the Contact Us section of the website. Here, you can also be directed to the Help page for the Frequently Asked Questions. If your question is not answered there, then you can continue down the page to get in touch with our team on Help Desk. If you choose this option, you'll be able to complete a web form to inform us about your query. These are set up to be directed to the team best suited to help you. This may be our technical team if you have a technical issue or our user support team if you have a question specific to a particular data set. We try to respond to all queries within five working days of receiving them, but please do try to explore our frequently asked questions first as the answer to your question may be there. Also, you could find something related that you are interested in, but had not thought of. As we near the end of this presentation, we are going to take a quick look at some of the resources and further help. We have compiled a small list of useful links and resources, such as our YouTube channel, where this webinar is being live streamed. There is also a link to our data catalogue if you'd like to browse through our repository, the help desk web form mentioned in the previous slides and how to browse data page are also available here. You can also find out more information from the codes shown here. So thank you for listening today. And uh, we've listed our methods of contact and our um, X Twitter feed here for you, as well as our news section. You can sign up and register for our newsletter. And we've also linked the data impact blog that we spoke about at the start of the presentation. So thank you for your time today.